In our reproduction unit, we've explored how eukaryotes, like humans, transfer genetic information. And we've explored how prokaryotes, like bacteria, transfer genetic information. But in this video, we're going to explore how viruses transfer their genetic information. Let's start by looking at the structure of a virus. It's important to note that there are many different viruses with different shapes but there are some commonalities to all of the viruses. One commonality is that all viruses have a protein coat called a capsid. Here's a capsid for a bacteriophage, a virus that infects bacteria. Here's the capsid of the tobacco mosaic virus, which infects plants. And here's the capsid of HIV, which infects humans. Viruses also contain genetic material either DNA or RNA, not both. And some viruses, particularly animal viruses, have an outer envelope made of phospholipids, and that envelope is usually derived from the cell that it recently infected. So how does a virus infect a cell? Well, one method is shown here by a bacteriophage. A bacteriophage, or phage for short, is a virus that infects a bacteria cell. And when it infects a bacterial cell, it first has to bind to the membrane of its host cell. And there are receptors on its capsid that will bind. Once it binds, it can then inject its genetic material, either DNA or RNA, into the cell. The capsid, the protein coat, stays on the outside. Here is the second method. First, the viral receptors bind the membrane, just like in the, sec the method we saw before. But here things are different. At this point, the host cell will take in the entire virus via endocytosis. Remember that endocytosis is when the cell membrane engulfs a particle, pinches off, and takes it in. At this point, the envelope and the capsid will break down, releasing the virus's genetic material into the cell. So that's how a virus can infect a host cell. But what happens next? Well, now the virus will use the host cell to replicate. And there's a couple different strategies it might use. The first strategy is the lytic cycle. So with the lytic cycle, again, first the virus receptors have to attach to the host cell. Again, this time we're looking at a phage virus attaching to a bacterial host cell. Then the DNA or the RNA is injected into the host cell. Then that viral DNA takes over the host cell and it makes new viral components, new viral DNA, new proteins using the host cell's materials. This is critical because a virus doesn't have very many enzymes and it doesn't have any organelles like ribosomes to make its own materials. This is why it has to take over a host cell in order to replicate. And this is also why viruses aren't categorized as living things. So as the virus takes over the host cell, it assembles new viruses using those materials. And once the new viruses are ready to go, they burst out of the cell in a process known as lysis. So when the cell lyses, it's just bursting, releasing the phages. So this type of repl replication is very destructive. It will destroy the host cell. The second type of replication is a little more insidious. This is called the lysogenic cycle. It starts off the same. The virus attaches to the host cell and injects its DNA. But here things are different. Instead of taking over the cell, the viral DNA inserts itself into the host cell's chromosome. So this darker blue is the bacterial chromosome, and this lighter blue is the viral DNA. And once it does this, it's called a prophage or a provirus. And it may just sit here for a while, not doing much of anything, hiding inside the host cell. And every time that host cell reproduces, that little bit of viral DNA reproduces as well. So after some time, there may be many cells in an organism that now have this viral DNA. And at any point, depending on environmental triggers, these cells could enter 
the lytic cycle and then start to cause some damage. Let's take a moment to focus on a particular type of virus called a retrovirus. And HIV is a retrovirus. What's interesting about this virus is that it has RNA as its genetic material, but it also has a special enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Some viruses have RNA, but they don't have this enzyme, and they're just called RNA viruses. But if a virus has reverse transcriptase, it's considered a retrovirus. So here is how HIV and other retroviruses work. So once the viral DNA or RNA is in the cell, RNA since it's a retrovirus, the first thing that happens is that that reverse transcriptase enzyme is used to reverse transcribe RNA into DNA. Once there is this strand of DNA, then a second strand of DNA is made, usually using the host cell's DNA polymerase. At this point, the viral DNA inserts itself into the host's DNA and becomes a provirus. And it may stay here for a few hours, a few days, even a few years. At some point though, it will become activated and the viral DNA will transcribe some viral RNA. And that viral RNA will leave the nucleus and find itself a ribosome. And that viral RNA will be translated to make viral proteins, at which point the newly assembled HIV virus will lyse or burst out of the cell. One final note. Viruses are very good at increasing genetic variation. First of all, they mutate just like other cells. But unlike cells, uh, viruses lack specific proofreading mechanisms. So in eukaryotic cells and even prokaryotes, there are special enzymes that can fix mutations, but those enzymes aren't present in viruses. And RNA viruses are especially error prone. And this is one reason why viruses can evolve so quickly. All of these mistakes happen much faster than in our cells. Another important note is that sometimes two different viruses can infect a cell at the same time. This is called co-infection. And during that process, the DNA from, or the RNA from the two different cells might recombine, increasing genetic variation. So this concludes our summary of how viruses transfer genetic information. And in class, we'll take a look at some viruses that we have been hearing about in the news and how they transfer their genetic information.